Uh, first off, thank you all for coming today. Um, as we have Dr. Christian Walzer speaking with us today for our first part of our webinar series of uh, World Zoonosis Day. Um, if, if you have any questions along the way, please pop those in the chat and Laura and I, who are co-hosts of this meeting, will keep track of those and ask those at the end during Dr. Walzer's question and answer. So Dr. Christian Walzer is the Executive Director of Health at the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's a board certified wildlife veterinarian and professor of conservation medicine at the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna, Austria. Author of more than 100 research publications and numerous book chapters, he lectures widely on health and conservation. And during the past two decades, he has worked in the Gobi region of Mongolia, linking wildlife health with the conservation of the pea horse and the Asiatic wild ass. Beyond Central Asia and, and equids, Dr. Walzer has an internationally recognized diverse expertise in working with wildlife, especially on the human livestock wildlife interfaces gained from combined years of leadership and research in Europe, Asia, and Africa. He acts as a consultant in wildlife matters for various organizations such as the UNDP, World Bank, FAO, and World Wildlife Fund. Over the past decade, he has additionally led several successful large-scale EU-funded ecological connectivity and biodiversity conservation projects in the Alps. Dr. Walzer is the recipient of several research and service awards, but most notably, the Distinguished Environmentalist Award from the Mongolian Ministry of Nature and Environment for contributions to the conservation of Mongolia's rare and endangered species. Uh, Dr. Walzer, thank you for joining us, and if you would like to take over now, that'd be great. All right, thank you very much. First of all, thanks very much for the, um, the invitation and for the introduction and a good evening from the Bronx. I hope everyone is staying well in the various places. I was quite excited that someone was dialing in at one o'clock in the morning from Edinburgh, but I appreciate Vancouver and every other place as well. So that's good. So let me, um, oops, anything here still? All right, I'm gonna give you uh, a sort of a whirlwind tour actually, I thought that would be quite appropriate. I can just give you a few background on the Anthropocene, talk about emerging infectious diseases, obviously a little bit of, about SARS coronavirus, the work we're doing on trade, but then also maybe some little reflections on conservation, health and society. Um, I won't be able to go in there in great depth and, and you know, I, I don't expect everyone to agree with what I say, but you might be sort of motivated to read up on it. And then I have a few ideas about what everyone at every um, level of the, and where you are in the profession can contribute. So let's, let's get in that. I'm sure you, you all know about the Anthropocene, of course, um, it was several decades ago that um, Nobel Prize winning scientist Paul Crutzen and his colleague Eugen Stromer popularized the term Anthropocene. And honestly, I'm not particularly interested now if this is a geologically recognized uh, new epoch after the Holocene, but basically what I'm trying to get at that it's undeniable that we live in an in a era that is dominated by human um, influence and it's undeniable that it's, um, economic and social political change um, has um, re resulted in a massive biodiversity crisis um, species extinction and that we exp um, exponentially um, you know exceed our planetary boundaries I think we all know that but one of the things that's quite interesting that came along with um, postulating um, the Anthropocene and discussing the Anthropocene was this idea that nature is dead or nature no longer runs the earth and we do we humans do and, or we as gods um, need to learn how to do it better. And, you know, <laughs> obviously that hasn't um, worked that well as far as I'm concerned. So that's sort of my background. And so within this whole um, um, Anthropocene background, we suddenly have this situation where the Anthropocene is being rocked by a virus, you know, that has spread relentlessly across the, from its natural environment into, um, the furthest corners of the of the earth, you know, bringing immense suffering and death everywhere. Um, and you know, this is two days ago. I'm sure all of you are well aware and and know everything about the pandemic. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the situation as it is now. But I think um, 
as I was putting this together, I came across this slide. This was put down on the 3rd of uh, March. I picked, this is a screenshot from the 3rd of March as I was doing an internal um, talk at WCS. So that's not very long ago, 3rd of March, 92,000 cases, 3,000 deaths. I think all of those deaths at the time were probably in China. And, um, you know, we just passed the 11 million now. So the scale and the speed at which um, this disease has spread across the world has really, I think, surprised many, if not just about all. So quick background to WCS, why WCS? Um, so we're the, as far as I know, the only global NGO with a really long-standing and robust health program, both on a captive side. So we have colleagues who work in one of the five zoos. So we have a very strong, um, some of you may be aware, residency program um, for zoological health in our institution. But then we have uh, the wildlife health, uh, the, the health side in our global program. And you know they've been interacting and working on health since 100 plus years is one of the um, founders of the One Health um, concept. And they really, let's put it bluntly, the cool thing about working at WCS, it's really multidisciplinary at its core. So working with field-based conservationists, we're doing a lot on, on wildlife trafficking. We work with lots of indigenous peoples and local communities around the world. We have a lot of ecologists, biologists, and so on and so forth. So that's um, the background basically where I'm coming from. Now, you World Zoonosis Day today. Thank you for reminding me. I'd already, I'd already passed me by, but it's true. Um, and you know that you obviously know that what zoonoses are. You all work in this field, and you you probably know that emerging infectious diseases are dominated by zoonoses. We we estimate as we it's estimated that about three quarters of all zoonotic emerging infectious diseases. Um, originate in wildlife, and the frequency of these um, has been increasing. And it's nothing new. We've um, we've always um, dealt with zoonotic diseases. Many and of the um, human diseases that were faced infectious diseases we initially acquired from um, animals, from mostly from the process of domestication. So during the, pro the domestication process, we acquired many viruses. Um, amongst the measles, for example, which is now a uniquely human disease. And um, there is actually this idea that, um, that population growth completely froze between um, 5,000 years and 10,000 years BCE because um, there were so many pandemics ongoing. And the population just sort of hovered around, it's estimated 5 million People and just didn't increase for 5,000 years as these naive populations were faced with these uh, new and emerging infectious diseases through the domestication process. Um, if you look at the, the outbreaks, the top row, this is a new uh, from a document which came out actually this uh, yesterday evening from the UN, uh, but I quite like the graphic. At the bottom row, you have um, various um, emerging infectious diseases of zoonotic origin on top you have the, the coronaviruses. Um, basically, just to sum it, <laughs> they're really increasing. And just to give you an example, look at the Ebola viruses. There's been 12 Ebola virus outbreaks in the De Democratic Republic of Congo since 1976. Of those 12, eight have occurred in the past 13 years. Now, I'll go back to the Ebola example as well, because it's also shifting where it is um, occurring. It's, um, when, when I went to university, quite some time ago, you know, Ebola was a really rare thing that happened somewhere in a dark forest somewhere in Africa. And it, it was tragic. It hit a community. It killed tens, maybe 20, 30 people. And that was it. And now, as you know, um, we, we just, um, the last two years, we've had three outbreaks just in the DRC. And then there was a Western African outbreak uh, just a few years ago. So um, it's really changed a lot. So let me go back to, to sars corona virus 2 and what do we know, what don't we know, and let's sort of look at the, the early days of the outbreak. So end of December, end of December, 
there was the notification from the Chinese authorities to WHO that there was some kind of infectious disease ongoing, some kind of um, pneumonia. And it was thought that it was, there was no human to human transmission. And the, in the initial reports, and unfortunately also in the case description, it had to be linked to this market in Wuhan. So this was a wildlife trading market, a huge industrial size market that also traded in wildlife. And because the original case description was linked to that market, it, it appeared in the first reports that all the cases were coming from that market and that it coming um, from, from this, probably from the wildlife because the virus was very quickly sequenced. It was, uh, I think it was the 13th or 14th of January that the full sequence was made available and it was clear that it was very closely related to the original SARS from 2002 and 2003. However, as more and more cases um, were worked on, it was apparent that not all these cases occurred from the market um, or were not linked epidemiologically to the market. And from the first 440 cases or so, about 55% were linked to the market, but the others had no, at least no um, detectable link. One thing that also um, really changed compared to 2002 and 2003 was the rapid spread of the virus. So SARS um, back in 2002 and 2003, luckily did never spread as quickly and as widely as this virus. The mortality rate of SARS, if you remember, was much higher than this SARS coronavirus 2 now. So that was one of the things that was um, quite impressive. Um, for those of you who want to dig in deeper, there's a fantastic um, New York Times piece called How, How It Got Out. It's an infographic, sort of a video that they've put together. And it's extraordinary. There is something like 750 people daily travel from Wuhan, China to New York City, daily, just to put it into perspective. So that obviously allows that virus to move a lot. So what do we know? We know it's a zoonotic pandemic, so the origin is zoonotic. The ancestral host, and there's broad consensus for that, is, is a coronavirus in a horseshoe bat species. These horseshoe bat species occur widely throughout Southeast Asia, across the Middle East, they're widely distributed, and they carry a lot of coronaviruses. But, but what is not clear is the time and place of the spillover event, and um, the mechanism of the spillover is unclear at the moment. There, um, someone's got a mic on, if you don't mind. I'm hearing it in my ear. Does someone? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the time and place of spillover event is unclear. There's, um, what is it important though to realize? There were 500 environmental samples taken at the market. And of those 500, unfortunately, we don't know very much about the type of samples that were taken. They're just declared as environmental samples. And of those, 33 were positive. And of the 33, 31 of them came from the Western part of the market where the wildlife and the wildlife traders were housed. So there is that strong signal to that part of the market, but unfortunately, the sample quality was very low. And so sequencing was only possible in four samples, as far as I know, and these four samples um, were identical with the human, with the first described human strain. So there, that would probably, um, you know, denotes that there was uh, already human contamination going on at that time. So basically information is lacking, we don't know. And honestly, um, it's gonna be very, very difficult at this point in time to determine um, how the how the virus moved from the horseshoe bat, how it recombined, um, which species may have been involved, because there's just a lack of, of samples. So basically, all these coronavirus, um, SARS, MERS, and SARS-2, are the results of com recombination among coronaviruses. And then, obviously, it's different selective pressures that work on that. So it's already well known that the coronaviruses within the bats are very good at recombining um, between bats. But if you um, give them the opportunity, of course, then these coronavirus can recombine in other species if you bring them in close proximity. An alternative way this could have happened as well is that a, in a rural community, the human population 
would have been infected directly from bat through bat poop or saliva or blood or whatever. And um, then there was a phase of cryptic infection with um, evolution within the human population without any, um, at least not detected clinical signs. So that's the alternative hypothesis. That would be a bit more far-fetched than um, the, the classic um, idea in the market. And I'll get back to that. Anyway, basically, it's not a surprise. You know, this is a time cover, I think 2017, if I'm not right, yeah, 2017. Sorry, yeah, 2017. And then, um, as you know, in 2018 already, the WHO had added um, a so called disease X to its priority um, watch list. And that was basically a serious international epidemic caused by a pathogen currently unknown to cause human disease, um, postulated that it could be a respiratory virus of zoonotic origin. So it was known, no big surprise. And basically what we really have to, at this point in time, really have to say it's not about bat soup, it's not about civets, it's not about pangolins. It's not even necessarily about markets, it's not necessarily about trade. Because if we put it into perspective, we have to acknowledge that there's in, in mammals and birds across the 25 so-called high-risk viral families, there's, it's estimated that there are 1.7 million unknown viruses. And of those 1.7 million viruses, it's estimated that some 400, uh, sorry, some 700,000 of them are likely to have zoonotic potential. That's a lot of viruses. So one way of addressing this by looking at species or selected markets or things like that is probably not going to work very well. Um, it's probably going to fail. And so basically, to put in perspective, for each of our the coronavirus that have been described, and there have been thousands described, there's other several thousand more for each and every one of them that are circulating in wildlife. So I'd like to break it down and say it's actually all about this. It's all about interfaces. You could look at this picture and you could say, well, this is a road that goes from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom, connecting two places. But from an epidemiological point of view, this is a super, super interface. So you have um, viruses circulating among species um, in the forest. These um, viruses can recombine, they will mutate, and basically they don't cause any issues whatsoever. Every now and then there may be a wildlife disease that breaks out and um, some species may be aff afflicted and you'll get an outbreak of disease. But what happens on these front lines, these, basically these, um, these lines are huge contact areas and sort of these edges of destruction. And it's already been shown from other authors that the interaction of humans within those first several hundred meters right and left of that road is quite intense. That's where wood is collected, where trapping occurs, um, and these you, you, there'll be some subsistence um, trapping there, of course, to feed your family and your community and, and so on. But the surplus will be brought to that road. And so that road provides a possibility for viruses to come from a previously intact forest, cross onto that road, and then cross into humans and their livestock. And every now and then, Unfortunately, uh, a virus will acquire, a pathogen in general will acquire the traits to be transmitted from human to human. And depending where that road leads to nowadays, you know, it, you're connected pretty quickly. So I always say a, a, a rat caught in Northern Republic of Congo gets to the N1 um, highway within an hour or two. 12 hours later, it's in the capital of Brazzaville if you cross this uh, river to Kinshasa, it's a multi-million um, city. And from there, it's another 12 hours and you're in Paris, for example, or in New York. So there is quite potential. Now, one thing though um, to, to not forget is that um, it's quite difficult for, for viruses to actually get across all these barriers. There's a lot of barriers that stop viruses switching species. So, you know, the... Um, the reservoir host has to have a sufficient density to, re to retain the pathogen so that they can actually be a reservoir. There has to be a pathogen release somehow, and there has to be human exposure to that pathogen. And then, of course, that 
pathogen, that virus needs to acquire the traits to bind to human cells and to human cells, replicate, and then subsequently maybe transmit to other human cells. It doesn't happen as often. Spillover events happen quite a bit. If you look at um, serum samples of veterinarians, for example, they've seroconverted against all kinds of stuff. And, um, but obviously, and thankfully, most of us don't, don't get sick from that. Um, but we'll have antibodies against some quite exotic um, pathogens every now and then. Um, I can just, I'll show you, there'll be a link at the end of this presentation and um, I'll share that with you in some text as well, where you can download some review documents we've put together in the past few months, mostly for administrations and governments to help them guide them as they develop um, legislation and, and policies to deal with um, this new reality of zoonotic diseases in their backyard, basically. So this is a very nice document that summarizes all the literature on ecological integrity and, and spillover events. And surprisingly, there's actually not that much robust literature and many of the things are very context specific. So the systems that work for Lyme disease here in New York do not work for similar pathogens in other landscapes. So that's one thing to keep, keep in mind as well. All right, let us, um, let us go back uh, to the market. And um, so as you can imagine, we talked about recombination, we talk about interfaces. If you bring 100 species of live wildlife from all parts of the country and in some time from the whole parts of the globe in small cages stacked them together, thousands of them, you're obviously, we don't need to go into the welfare issues. They're obviously super stressed out. They're gonna be pooping and urinating on top of each other. And you'll have this fantastic thing. You'll have a Southeast Asian raccoon dog. It's gonna poop on a, on a African pangolin. And that's gonna be standing on a, on a, on a box full of um, domestic chickens next to a, a pig. And this goes on all the time, all the time, yeah. So it's a numbers game. You're just providing a lot of opportunities. Then you take an animal out and you slaughter it. You'll have the blood and the organs exposed. All of you or most of you have probably gone through your path um, training. Um, just imagine you were, that's the way you would work in, in pathology. Everything that comes in gets slaughtered, the blood gets mixed up, and then you'll have your lunch in there as well. So it's obviously, you know, we call it, uh, we've been using this term up and saying a lot, it's a cauldron of contagion. It's really like, if you tried really hard, how this is the best way to create a lot of new viruses. And remember one thing I also want to really point out, it's not about wet markets, by the way. It's, it's, that term is completely misused. It's wet markets are seafood markets where there's fresh produce. They are essential to provide um, uh, food for, for communities, even in large urban centers. It's about the wildlife trade happening within those markets, about the wildlife trade, legal, illegal, sustainable, unsustainable, it doesn't matter. It's just the sheer volume and size of this trade that's going on in there. They, um, there's very little um, information uh, available on the, on the economic, um, how do you say, the, the, the scale of it. But it's estimated that um, there's some, it's in, it's in the hundreds of billions of US dollars, just in Southeast Asia alone. If you think there's um, in, in Vietnam, I'm, I'm just sorry, I need to actually look, I can't remember the figures. Um, in, it's so $400 billion is one of the figures that's been put out there. Um, since it also includes illegal trade, which is in the tens of billions of dollars, it's really hard to get good data. But as you can imagine, a lot of people employed in this and it's a big trade, let's keep it at that. And the other thing, there's been a lot of organizations which have been focused on the market and, and some of them have even come up with these really, in my point of view, ludicrous ideas. Let's close the 50 most high risk markets. That's interesting if you have thousands of them, which one are you gonna choose? What's a high risk market? Um, that's just not the way it, it works from an epidemiology point of view. And then the other thing which is really important to understand it's not only about the market, it's actually like a trade value chain. So we've done this study using field rats, which is sort of a generic name for various species of rats, which are used for consumption in Southeast Asia. And this is from Vietnam, and it's just been published now. What you see here is that as, as this field rat moves along the food value chain, so basically from its capture site, 
in, in some rice field. And then it's then moved to a trader, to a larger market, and then from that market to a restaurant kitchen. It basically increases its positivity to coronaviruses. And that's really important. So if you're going to eat one uh, or going to process one, do it on the field. You know, it's a 20% it's chance, basically, that you'll get exposed to coronavirus. In a restaurant kitchen, every second one, every second one already was... Um, was exposed. Obviously, the, the one that's so beautifully prepared down in the bottom right is not an issue anymore because it's cooked. But the cook who had to put it together and who, who slaughtered it or um, prepared it in the kitchen and the kitchen environment, of course, would be now contaminated from these uh, things. One thing I also want to just, before we, we leave this coronavirus, is I also want to point out the large scale of legal trade in wildlife. Um, which occurs in Southeast Asia. And so these are various species, but it's the, the famous civet, it's the, um, the raccoon dog, the porcupines, the bamboo rats, um, and, and various bird species, snakes and frogs and so on, which are bred um, on, on a very large scale and have quite an economic, uh, quite an important um, economic importance. But of course, it absolutely pales to the cost of this um, pandemic. So it's estimated that it's, you know, 20, 30 billion US dollars per year generated in China alone. There's maybe 6 million people employed in this trade. Um, it was a government driven initiative to alleviate poverty back um, about 30 years ago. So it's not, the other thing is not historic, it's not thousands of years old. This is actually quite a, a modern concept. So 20,000 farms in China is estimated. And um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then remember these, um, these large pools of wildlife are also great places for viruses to evolve in. So if you're circulating in thousands of civets or in porcupines or so on, that's a really good place to evolve. All right, so that's sort of the background on, on SARS uh, and the coronavirus and obviously COVID. Now, there's still, I'd like to go back to, so what are the consequences for conservation, health, and society? And I, I want to sort of preempt this as well, that basically my life has been, <laughs> since the 15th of March, uh, 15th of um, January, when our organization said, all right, this is going to be a really big outbreak. Um, I had a text from a friend of mine who's a senior researcher at NIH, and he said, this is the big one, you've got to get on board. So since that day, this is all I've been doing. So I've, I now also live in the Bronx, um, which, as you know, is, is not an area where, where um, everything is fair and equal and um, just, I have to say that quite clearly. So we started this out and I said, you know, the, the idea is in the Anthropocene that we run nature. And um, well, Obviously, that's not the case. <laughs> you can see it how you want to, but we're obviously not running this show at the moment. We're scrambling to try to limit its impact, but we're definitely not running the show anymore. So that's, um, we still have a lot of impact, but we're not running the show. I think, at least from my perspective, that's one thing. The other thing this pandemic has done is really laid bare the fragility of our economic systems. You know, the gross growth-based uh, socioeconomic concepts that we have have really been um, upheaved. And it's probably more here in the United States that's more apparent than maybe in my, my home country in Austria, but still it is impressive everywhere. But all these things, as far as I'm concerned, provide great opportunity because there's one thing, conservation has been doing this for, you know, our organization is 125 years old. Most people don't get why we need to do conservation. But the health impacts and the deaths within our own family, basically a bat virus is killing my neighbor down the road here, really drives it home how important it is, how we interact with our nature and that we are not separate from nature. We are an integral part and um, we, need to, we need to address that. We cannot leave it. So I, for me, I see this as a very positive, you know, for all the tragedy and everything. We do need to... Um, recognize the opportunity as we move forwards. And um, so basically in my way I see it is that COVID is you know, just a symptom of 
of the alien planetary health has reminded us of the, you know, the basic fact, human, animal, plant, environmental health, and everything is intrinsically connected. But it really does um, provide this uh, potential to highlight stewardship and value health. I just want to take a little diversion. So you do bear with me as a little European. Um, I have a different concept sometimes of how the world should be run. But I just, you know, you'll have to read up on this on yourself. So one of the things I've done this talk for some European colleagues in, in this form more or less, and I, I told them, you know, the Anthropocene is dead and we shouldn't be using that term. We should be using the term the capitalism. There's one thing I want to say about the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene sort of states, first of all, it's the age of man. It's already problematic. But the other thing about that is it sort of implies that we all, all of us, are responsible for the problems and that we're equally responsible for the problem. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is not the way it's happening. Definitely not all of us to the same extent and certainly not every day. So, and the, the, the opportunity there is that this society that's driven by capital really relies on cheap nature. You need to undervalue nature and the, 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 um, the, the services nature provides and the regulatory and so on. So climate change, paired with this pandemic have really changed that equation. So the costs of nature have absolutely exploded. So there is really no way to go back anymore and to continue as it was before, because it's just too expensive. Um, I didn't, I think I must've skipped over that. Be aware the this pandemic, the, the global costs for this pandemic have been now estimated at potentially reaching 30 trillion US dollars. That is a figure which is so beyond my comprehension that, um, and, and certainly probably for you as a student, it must be as well, unless it's related to the, the cost of studying, I'm not quite sure. But it's a lot of money, obviously. We're now gonna go, we can't do this again. So I think there's this opportunity there to, to move forwards. From us, from our veterinary side of things, um, it really makes it very clear that we need to work on a transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, fashion and we need to reach out beyond the you know the life sciences i think it's very very important when we address these large problems societal problems and um, societal drivers of spillover events we need to reach out to ecological economists to political scientists and so on and so on and the other thing and i've been involved a lot with developing you know various one health documents and blah 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 talk about it all the time at the moment we really need to find out how are we actually going to operationalize and get this down pat that it actually works. It's really nice and easy to draw all these things. We, we know it in our head, but how do we actually implement it on the ground? So this is a big part of my work at the moment. So what can each and every one of us do and contribute? Well, I think one of the big things each and every one of us could do is fight this infodemic. I think we, we can um, each use our own um, opportunities. We all have multiple um, channels which we can use. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, do a TikTok dance. It's been super, super successful. Um, defending science, defending facts. And then the other thing is there's a lot of science out there. As I said, 2018, it's already, you know, WHO basically said this was going to happen. Others had done that as well. But we need to make sure that we're translating science so that it is actually available to decision makers and um, policy so that it can be implemented. It's, you know, it's, we're, we try to publish and we look, oh, what's the highest impact factor? And, well, then you can be pretty sure, it's great for us, okay, from an academic point of view, but we can be pretty sure no one's gonna read it. So we do need to also work, if we do publish important work, we need to make sure it also gets out in the media and is adequately translated. And then, you know, obviously we provide education. So that's something each and every one of us can do. We're science trained and we're, most of us savvy in communicating nowadays. Then as an organization like WCS, of course, we, we, we reach out to, to inform policy. Our big push 
and you know we get a lot of pushback for this as well is the permanently banned commercial trade of wildlife and consumption we're really focusing on live animals we're focusing on the large urban centers where the new middle class is buying this expensive food um, we're really aware of of other um, of, the, of that um, focus and obviously trafficking and changing the behaviors just want to finish this quickly two two three slides and we're done the other thing is of course working with indigenous peoples and local communities which are directly impacted by its trade the people in in the congo basin for example or some areas in, in latin america and the amazon so are absolutely reliant on this wild meat and wild products to meet their nutritional protein needs and so on if you have these huge markets in china suck and not only china southeast asia sucking out these forests and emptying the forests um, it impacts these communities so we have to work on a dual sort of um, way on the one side with the um, indigenous people and local communities that are dependent on the meat and facilitate um, their access while also working on providing alternatives and um, at the same time trying to ban them. Then also working on the front lines, of course, of research, that would be a, a, a topic uh, in its own right, but working on these spillover front line sampling, pairing that with you know, modern and constantly evolving um, technology like you know, small handheld sequences, qPCR driven by iPhones and so on. Um, which allows us to detect some of these diseases very, very quickly within 40 minutes to an hour in the deep depth of the forest. So basically, just to finish off, as far as I'm concerned, the world has irrevocably changed and there is no going back and we need to make sure we're not going back. We can't, I can't do this every, we can't do this every few years. Um, our community as veterinarians and wildlife health and health professionals, we play a really central role. We need to support the decision makers we need to speak up, stand up, and um, make clear that intact and functioning ecosystems are really providing the core infrastructure for our life and well-being on this only planet we have. And you know, we, it's we're going to get a lot of pushback, but you need to stand up and um, speak out. So I think that's really important. And I think you will have these links afterwards. A lot of documents there and updates and. Really important questions you can reach out to me as well of course and it might take a long time to get back from me thanks very much for your attention and sorry i went over that a little bit there all right thank you dr walzer um so we do have a couple questions that were sent to us um the first being what do you think the veterinarian's role um, is in the prevention of these pandemics So I think one of the um, one of the really good things is that as veterinarians, generally at, in all our schools, I think th throughout the globe, we are trained in public health and veterinary public health. So we have a very clear understanding. We all learn about um, farm to fork and the proceeds and how this works, and we understand spillovers. And you know, the spillover in Ebola is not much different than you would have another kind of spillover along any other kind of um, food value chain or in your in your um, herd health management and so on. So we're inherently well um, trained in, and it's a question of engaging. And as I said, it doesn't always have to be in the depth of Africa. You can, you know, that's the, it always sounds like it's super exciting. Everyone's crawling around in Africa doing things. Honestly, the most important thing you can do at this point in time is reach out and blog and talk and talk because what you need to do at the moment is inform policy funding you you need to do that that's the way it's it's boring i know it's boring my whole life has changed from chasing things in the wilds to to blogging <laughs> i hope that answers the question sort of yes thank you uh and the next one that we have is on the level of the wildlife trade within markets what do you propose is done to decrease the chance of a pandemic happening again so I think there's a yeah there's a there's a gradient there. So the first thing I think we need to do is very clearly we need to ban the trade of wildlife for consumption in in mammals and birds, and especially in live animals in the large urban centres, where we're really impacting 
the rich, we're impacting the new middle class because the wildlife meat is expensive and it's, it's, a, um, it's a luxury item or as in a pangolin is a, is a status symbol. If I can afford to buy a pangolin and share it with you, I'm basically, you know, it's as if I bought a, whatever it is around here, what do you buy a Ford Mustang or something? I'll take you out for dinner. You know, um, that's why I'll, I'll serve you a pangolin. So we're not impacting meat. There's no need to eat this. So that would be number one. And then as we you know, move down that chain, obviously the, the markets in, in Africa as well, which mostly serve dead and often even smoked meat, which are much less risk and much fewer species, um, we need to provide alternatives. And so there's some interesting alternatives which have come up, which is, for example, we've got a thermal stable vaccine now for Newcastle disease in, in, for poultry. And so for the first time, it's actually possible to keep poultry in many of these places as backyard chickens. And that sets up a whole business loop because someone's got to raise the chicks. And, you know, we use um, some of the projects now are using invertebrates. So you, someone's raising the invertebrates, the invertebrates are being fed to the chicks, the chicks are then sold on. And then you have, a, you know, multi-use poultry with egg and meat and so on. So you create business opportunities as well. And you provide an alternative. That's going to take much longer time. And then obviously the other thing is this demand reduction side. People have moved into big cities. There's no need anymore for bushmeat, but they like it. So we need, a, we need to work on that as well. All right. Um, and then we have one final question from one sent in, and then I will open it up for everybody else uh, who wants to ask one. Um, so one of the questions, or the last question we have is, what do you propose as a solution to supplement the farmers who supply this wildlife to these markets for consumption? Yeah, so um, one thing I did neglect to, to mention, first of all, the, uh, China has imposed a, a, a temporary and a permanent ban on the use of wildlife for consumption. They did that already in February, and we've been working since February behind the scenes on the new legislation. So the new legislation is being put in place. As you can imagine, it's actually quite interesting working on Chinese legislation. First of all, you get it machine translated. It doesn't get much better when it gets translated. But it's never, no one ever developed this legislation to think about problems of like, we're going to eat and slaughter pangolins from Africa on a market, and then we're going to mix it with pigs. And so it's completely inadequate. So it's, it's not like you just copy, paste, and change it. So, um, but that's in place. Um, we do hope in the next two months that it will be in, enshrined in legislation. And Vietnam is following um, suit as well to limit, at least to limit the trade and use for consumption. So that's the one side of it. Um, the other is, uh, Sorry, I, I, I think I walked, talked myself into a wormhole now. Can you, I, I probably didn't answer the question because I was so full of myself. Sorry, go ahead. Help oh, no. oh, no, no, you're fine. Uh, it was, you, were on the, you were along the lines of, of asking it. It was, um, how do you supplement the farmers or what is the solution ah, to yes. supplement the farmers for this? Yeah, so, you know, it's just from an economic point of view. I was saying it, it's, I think it's 20, 30, maybe 40 billion US dollars um, that they generate. Um, so what the Chinese are now already doing, they're just providing incentives for them to, oh, not, you know, it's China, it's incentive. You need to, you can only stop this, but we will give you money. We will pay for you to stop doing this. And I don't know the actual figures, but they, they are just paying out these farmers and providing training and alternative incomes. You know, from a economic point of view, it makes no sense. That's, it's such a little, to be gained with so much losses. Thank you. Um, so somebody commented in uh, as a question. Uh, Many of these discussions showcase the importance of involving indigenous communities. How can veterinarians support other veterinarians and scientists within this community and prevent imposing a white saviorism slash colonial colonialist approach to combating wildlife trade? Yeah. So obviously, you need to. Um, so when I say we work, and I, I sit here in my, my office, in the box, we, we do actually have a, a large office in, in China, and we're working exclusively through Chinese NGOs and, and colleagues in China. None of us would impose. Actually, any comment made in the United States at the moment um, is detrimental. That's really, obviously, as you know, the situation. We have a lot of... Um, 
talking on the hill with you know senators for example who quite understand what they're, they want to help but it's just they can't there's nothing they can do at the moment. so it does need to be localized and context specific and it does change from china is a different situation than vietnam and laos and cambodia and then you know indonesia for example one of the largest markets completely different situation so you do have to work with um, the local administration that's the most important and then as you move further away, then you, you start working with the um, indigenous peoples. And if you look, and local communities, if you look on the WCS webpage, there's actually quite a good guideline on how that's done. We work with some, let me get this right now, I think some 423 something indigenous peoples around the globe and a thousand so-called local communities. And um, so there's a lot of knowledge on how to work and engage with them. And it's always the same. You first, you listen, and then you have participatory processes to, to work with. I mean, it sounds easy, you know, but I can, get my, I can get my colleague to talk to you about it once. It's quite intricate, of course. All right, well, thank you. The next question, um, how do we in the United States work with other nations on the education and policy of the dangers of these market interfaces? What organizations are the targets for this discussion? So the United States um, used to be the absolute leader in, in this. Uh, through the USAID uh, funding scheme, they funded um, multiple projects, notably among us veterinarians are obviously the PREDICT-1 and PREDICT-2 projects, which were under the guidance of um, UC Davis, with multiple partners with EcoHealth Alliance as one of the research institutes and the team around Peter Daszak and then WCS and Smithsonian was involved and so on. And these were big consortia and this, um, they went on for 12 years. PREDICT2 is still just finishing up. We've had some small extension on that. And, and a lot of the knowledge that you see out there now about how many viruses out there, what kind of viruses are circulating in bats and so on come from the PREDICT project. And there's a shift now. So PREDICT ended and it was supposed to end. You had to, you know, there's been a lot of trashing of <laughs> the government, of course, but it was actually planned to end. It's really unfortunate that it's ending as the biggest global pandemic comes out. You know, it's just bad timing. I think if you'd been more agile, they could have very quickly said, okay, we just keep funding this now for the next, uh, we just keep running the consortium because they're on the ground, they're in all these countries, they know what they're doing. I think that would have maybe been useful. But anyway, the, um, and so there is big USAID funding coming along, but the EU, uh, the German government has really stepped up and we're also working with the French government. And so other governments have sort of stepped in you know, trying to help as well. But it's mostly this um, area, either it's a direct um, research through the normal research channel, otherwise it's more that um, development aid umbrella where these things are happening. It's a lot about training, training and capacity building. Awesome. Thank you. So we have a, a two-part question next. So, so we have somebody that's interested in the legislation um, proposed for the Chinese government. Um, so the first two questions, what kinds of limitations are being proposed um, to the Chinese government and then how could they be enforced? Yeah, so um, it's actually impressive and I, it, this is obviously not public knowledge, so I, I'll be quite <laughs> a bit... <laughs> How will say? Anyway, I'll just tell you one thing I nearly fell over backwards. I got the a list of the animals that they were going to allow, because obviously there are some wildlife which is long tradition deer. Yeah? I mean, they seek a deer, and I think what else do they have? Another deer, seek a deer, and another one. Really, it'd be ridiculous for us to say they can't eat seek a deer, and then we eat it here in the US and Europe and everywhere. So the, the list is honestly, I think it was only six or seven species of wildlife that they allow, they're, they're planning to allow, and they want to ban basically all the other species. Um, which is interesting. Of course, there will be an uptick in black market. Um, there will be a bit, but one thing to always remember, and WCS is the largest anti-trafficking organization in the world, so we have a, quite a deep understanding of it. The, the black market is always going to be a very small part compared to what's legal and open at the moment. It's not even legal, it's just tolerated, some of it. So the black market will be small. And the other thing that's really important, it's important for the Chinese and the culture and the way they eat the animals, the animals need to be alive. So just imagine if it's a black market and you want to 
how many live pangolins are you going to be able to sell? It's just logistically difficult and, and your, your profit margin will drop. There will always be someone trying to make a, a buck, obviously. So the legislation, I think, looks, looks good, um, but it's running out to a complete ban. There's been requests for um, enhanced training for, for the implementation. And the advantage of a complete ban is as well that you don't have um, you know, border officials or others who have to decide, is this now a pangolin or is this some kind of other animal which looks like it? So everything's illegal except two deer and one bird species and whatnot. One of the problems has always been recognizing which species was legal and which one was um, illegal. You know, it's difficult, you know, we might know but if you're a border patrol unit somewhere and you catch a truck in the middle of the night, it's dark, you shine your flashlight in there, it's hard to tell what's in there, and then you might let it go. Thank you for that. And the second two parts of the question um, is, uh, are the incentives supplying, uh, supplied to the farmers sustainable in the long term? And then what is being done to deter the population from consuming wildlife? Yeah, so two things I'm honestly I can't really answer the first one. I would hope someone has thought this through. Um, if you disrupt the market and you provide incentives for a certain period of time, people go on and develop new markets. I mean, I think that's the way it's, you need to provide them alternative income for a long period of time. But as I pointed out before, that is so cheap compared to the impact it, another outbreak would have. It, you know, it just makes absolute economic sense. And the second part of the question was, sorry. So, no, you're fine. Uh, so what is being done to deter the general population ah, from yes. consuming this wildlife? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of what's, you know, termed social marketing going on. And it's actually been very impressive. So there was a, uh, a survey done just recently, I think maybe a month and a half ago in China using one of the platforms. I don't know if it was Weibo or one of the other ones. They surveyed thousands of people. It was like 92% of the respondents said they would not consume wildlife anymore. They, and it's too dangerous, it's, um, it's, it's not worth it, and people who do this are barbarians, really basically along those lines. So there is a real shift in the new generation. I'm sure there's a bias in who uses these platforms, but I think that's something that's being built on a lot with the social marketing uh, things. And Vietnam has been also very successful in the past, you know, five, six years, moving their wildlife trade and getting people away from it. it takes time. And so we have a couple more questions here. So uh, the first one, a lot of wet markets in China and other countries and the selling and trade of wildlife within them are driven by deeply rooted cultural drivers and traditional medicine that have been a part of the country's culture for thousands of years. Um, wet markets and the wildlife trade need to be addressed um, through new policies. How do we go about addressing these things and that are deeply rooted in that type of culture? Um, and especially as organizations that come from outside a country that do not share that. Yeah, so obviously the first thing is you don't come from outside. That's the, as I said before, you don't, you know, we're, we're providing technical support for, for colleagues in China and other organizations. So it's really technical. We actually do know what legislation will need to look like. So if you want to develop legislation, I can take my experience from EU legislation where we have this and use it in, in China also, you know, supply it and then we take it or leave it. Now, one of the things about rooted in tradition, I would be a bit careful about that. It's true, and this is obviously, you know, especially in times like this, it's a very important discussion. And certainly you don't, someone had already brought up, so sort of this neo-colonialism approach that we know everything better and so on. But two things, I'm gonna, gonna lean out a little bit here. There's two things. Whereas one of them, a lot of things are not um, in um, in enshrined or not um, traditional. The, Farming of wildlife in China is a very recent um, industry that was um, created um, in the 80s, the original in the 1980s, um, to alleviate poverty in rural um, areas. So the idea was you start breeding um, rats and porcupines and so on, create food and protein, and that will help you create a business, alleviate poverty, and this is basically it has to be seen in the context of the, um, of 
the large um, starvation um, periods following the Mao um, period. So th that is really, and that is well, well documented. What is rooted in thousands of years of tradition is the use of wildlife in traditional um, medicine. But there as well, I would just, I basically refer to my Chinese um, public health and veterinary public health colleagues who have been stating since the SARS outbreak, we need to stop this. This is too dangerous. There's just too much going on. And, you know, the academy has stated this. So Chinese scientists and our colleagues in China are on it. They've been pushing for this at all. They actually need a little bit of help from, from us sometimes to say, yes, this is the, um, we need to stop. Traditional medicine is a whole other pot, which unfortunately we're not going to, and I'm not an expert on that either. So that's it. Remember the risk is less, much less because the things are dead. You know, it's, we're talking about the um, dead pangolins and basically only talking about bits and pieces of pangolins. It's not a risk as a live animal. And by the way, the poor pangolins should be given its probably with clean dogs or something. Thank you for that. And so we have two more questions left um, for you, Dr. Walzer. Um, and these will be our final two questions of the webinar series. So thank you to all who submitted. Um, the second to last question is, how does wildlife farming compare in disease spread and risk compared to trapping slash selling of these animals in wet markets? You know, there's probably, there's not much comparative work been done. So one of the comparisons we've been using a lot at the moment is we've been comparing, you know, the zoonotic risk uh, from industrial agro-industry production of swine and, and poultry. You know, we all know the poultry story. Um, you know, the, the influenza virus we acquire from live poultry markets and so on. But, I mean, that is well documented. And we know that if we stop those live markets, we would have less influenza outbreaks. But so one thing, the big difference is we know a lot about what's going on in poultry and pig production, cattle, and so on. While they do have a lot of viruses and some of them do have potential for novel and emerging diseases, we know a lot about them and we have procedures globally on how to track and manage these diseases. And they're pretty robust. I mean, the OIE has a, you know, you all know the OIE, there's a good list in the US here. You have, I think the USDA is the main regulatory um, agency. For, for your livestock and you know if you've ever had to deal with USDA they're on it yeah they're not going to say oh you take that bison and drive it to Arkansas and then mix it with cows on a herd there and they're not going to test it for anything there, there's rules and regulations difference with wildlife is we know very very little so even you know in these these farms they're farmed you could sort of imagine creating some kind of monitoring system, maybe for rats. But once you start putting in raccoon dogs and this and that and everything, it just becomes impossible just from this side of things. So I think that's the main problem. We just know far too little about um, wildlife and we haven't gone through that phase of domestication with them. And, and we, we won't, I don't think. Thank you. Um, and so our last and final question um, for this series is, does the ban in China only apply to wildlife taken from the wild as compared to species bred in captivity? If this is the case, will the trade of captive bred wildlife still pose a similar risk for disease transmission? Yes, it would. And that's why the ban is for all wildlife, irrespective if it's bred in captivity, sustainable is illegal and so on. It's for all. And they, they've obviously also realized a lot of the things they were addressing were already illegal, but just no one had actually enforced it. So um, yes, all wildlife. Thank you very much. And, and on behalf of SABMA, Dr. Walzer, thank you for taking time to speak with us about this incredibly important opportunity. And I hope that as SABMA students, you all are as empowered as I am after this and educated on this topic. Um, and I just want to say thank you again, Dr. Walzer, for taking time into educating us on this. Thanks for the invitation. It was my pleasure. Everyone have a nice evening wherever you are. Stay safe and sane, I guess, as well. All right. All the best. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.